this is a large semantics thing, and you're gonna get people that are overly technical saying that. Uh, it's I, not, I want to pause real quick, and, and I just want to point <laughs> out the idea that Carrie would say that somebody is gonna get overly technical <laughs> is one of the funniest <laughs> things that's ever happened on this show. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Everybody, welcome back to the Nerd Nest Podcast. We've got a bit of a cut down group today. There's just the three of us. It's me, it's Russ, it's Carrie. Guys, I hope you're having a fantastic day. We have a lot of stuff to talk about, and I want to start this off uh, by talking about the the the, the ROG Ally Two, which was just um, I don't want to say announced, but it feels like a foregone con conclusion because the you know, the guy in charge of Asus said, you know, oh, I guess I guess we are going to put out a new version this year. <laughs> um, I I mean, I sent a message to you guys and I was like, why would they announce that now? Just announce it when it's getting ready to come out, because who in their right mind is going to buy an ROG Ally one at this point, knowing that in just six months or so? We're gonna get the ROG Ally too, Russ. What do you what, like? What was your reaction when you read that? Yeah, same kind of thing. I'm like, well, yeah, no one wants to buy the first one now, or they're just gonna wait until it goes on clearance. You know, when the second one comes out, and it's still gonna be a nice machine at that point as well, but probably a hundred dollars or even more cheaper. And so, yeah, I mean, the other part of it, I thought to myself, I'm like, well, he's he's tempering expectations because he's trying to say we're not Valve, we're not gonna be releasing it in a console cycle, we're releasing this more in a laptop cycle, like you do with a refresh of all their other product lines. And so, um, that that's kind of a good thing on their end just to kind of get people ready for the idea that yeah we'll be doing this every year kind of thing so i don't think it's a bad thing in that perspective but yeah i'm not sure how much it's going to sell now well uh, what do you mean what do you mean by it's going to sell do you mean the one or the two the one the original sorry yeah like the yeah, one that's available okay. right now i don't know how many people are going to want to buy it now they're like well let's just wait for the new thing and i don't know it's, it's always hard to tell too because how many people are just going to buy the bleeding edge thing and others are just kind of Oh, now's the time because I got, you know, a Christmas bonus or whatever. And so there's always there's always many factors involved. It's not necessarily just a oh, I have to buy like bigger number better kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think that um a lot of people really push back on this idea that we would get new hardware every year from these companies like Asus and probably Lenovo, um, where they're gonna put out a new one every year, just like they do with laptops. And a lot of people are like, I don't want to buy one every year. And the thing that I always okay. say to those people is nobody is making you buy every single one. But when you're ready to buy one, then the newest one isn't that old. And so you get to get the, the most bang for your buck. Plus, the older ones are cheaper. So you can make a decision about, I'm going to go with this one because if it's a lower price point, or I'm going to go with this one, because it's a little bit more future proof, um, you know, it'll last the longest. Now, other right. people have said, well, hold on, Bill, you're not going to get very much of a boost each time. And that's absolutely true. I totally get that. But I still don't see why people feel like just because they bought one last year, that Anybody who buys one this year has to buy the one that they bought or else they feel like they got ripped off. What, what are your thoughts on that, Carrie? Uh, well, specifically with this generation, it seemed like, <clears throat> based on the naming scheme, right, the Z1, that there was going to be a Z2. Uh, so this is just AMD's way of acknowledging that there is a handheld scene for the PC scene uh, happening, much like the Steam Deck has created. So the Z1 is a offshoot of the 7840U, their, their high-end laptop spec, uh, consumer-grade laptop spec. There's the HS and HX ones, which are like very high wattage workstation laptops type of deal, where <clears throat> technically the 7840U and 7840HS, HX, all of those ones, well, the HX is going to be Dragon Range, so you have 16 cores. It's a different CPU arrangement. Um, when you look at them, there's not really any difference. You can have 7840U compete against 74, uh, 7840HS just by pushing more power into it. That's literally the only difference. Mm. So when you take a look at Z1, 
it's a 7840U without the XNDNA stuff active. They disable that. And we already know that the 8840U is a 7840U with upclocked XNDNA parts, which will be disabled on the Z2. So the Z2 and the Z1 are more or less going to be exactly the same. The only thing that we're going to see potentially is a GISA updates. Uh, so the, for the microcode firmware update, firmware level stuff that may act differently between these two models. So potentially there is something in there that could happen that makes things a bit better. And the reason I say that is because right now, even on the ASUS RG Ally, you can just like disable hyper, uh, uh, boost, turbo boosts. Right. And get mm-hmm. significantly better battery life and no difference in performance for certain games because you don't need to spend all that power on going to three gigahertz, 3.5 gigahertz on the CPU. You'll be fine at 2.4 gigahertz. It's just that right now, Windows and AMD, largely a lot of things do a very, very bad job of saying, oh, the game is running at 60 FPS. I don't need to be burning all this power to achieve this, but there, we're in this realm right now. So quite literally, the Z2, this next generation, the Asus RG Ally 2, from a performance standpoint, ostensibly looks like it's going to be absolutely the same. So there will be no difference between these two. Yeah. Outside of maybe the Asus RG Ally has, uh, 2 has 32 gigs of RAM. Maybe it has an OLED panel. So this is this is where you find where things can be improved, and that's the only place that we're you know you're really going to see things. Um, so yeah, it's 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 not that like anyone should, especially right now with what we know, no one should be like, oh, I got the Asus RG Ally. I'm like the performance. Good. It's not going to be that at all. You're going to have slightly better performance where games need uh, more uh, RAM, so just more VRAM, so texture data size. That'll be an improvement. Perhaps if it's an OLED VRR, that's going to be sick. Um, so that's where we, I still love the Asus RG panel itself. The one, the LCD of VR panel yeah. is fantastic. Uh, there's also some other news about that that I can't talk about right now, but uh, there's good stuff coming just from that alone. So I don't know. From my point of view, getting an Asus RG Ally 1, like open box for like 500 bucks is like an insane deal. You, you know, it you, uh, was AYN, their Loki, uh, went, just got discounted. And even at the price that it is, I'm like, I probably would just recommend someone get an open box ally. Uh, right. Russ, didn't you yeah. say that you saw an open box ally for like 300 or something? They were doing 399 for the Z1, non-extreme one. Yeah, um, so the, oh, a, the non-extreme, yeah. okay. Yeah, so not the performance in that is not great, but no. uh, that price is still, man, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so the thing I is with this... Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to no, say, you know, even laptop-like manufacturers understand that they people aren't going to be buying these every year. And so I have two schools of thought. The first one is that anytime a new laptop spec comes out, I never hear anyone saying, well, now my laptop's obsolete, right? But somehow right. that happens with like a handheld console. Like, oh, now there's an ROG Ally 2. My ROG Ally is obsolete. Like, that's that's something we're going to be seeing. The other thing is that like... I remember when the uh, M3 MacBook Pros were announced, they did all their spec comparisons like, look, it's 50% faster, blah, blah, blah. But they did it against the M1. They didn't even do it against the M2 because they were like, they were specifically targeting people, not those who were buying it every year, but those who maybe bought the M1s, you know, a few years back and were ready for an upgrade. And so they they really tailored their marketing specifically for that kind of uh, like two generation uh, upgrade kind of thing. So even on the laptop, thing they're they're not expecting people to buy one every iteration right and it's 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 like phones people Mm. i mean yeah there there are people that buy a new phone every single year but most people buy a phone and then when they when they decide all right i think it's time for me to upgrade they just either get the newest one or they get one that's a couple of years old uh at a, a steeper discount which this is no different than that. The thing is, is that people somehow, I don't understand why, because these are PCs. I know that I've said console a thousand times. These are PCs and they play all the same games, but somehow people come to these with a console mentality where when the PS4, or I'm sorry, when the PS5 comes out, the PS4 is obsolete. When the new Xbox comes out, well, guess what? The number of games that are com- going to come out for the Xbox One, the old one, like those, those are going to 
be less. Like you're not going to be able to get those games for very much longer. But when we're talking about these handheld PCs that are very console-like, they're still going to keep playing the same games that they've always been able to play and the new games that are coming out as long as they have enough power to run them. And mm -hmm. I think that people just, like, there's this strange barrier that I feel like people have trouble getting over when it comes to, I don't want them to put out a new thing. Now, some people will say, if they put out a new thing, they'll stop supporting the old thing. I, I think these companies, with the exception of Valve, they're going to, whether they put out a new thing or not, they're going to stop supporting the old thing anyway, just because that's what they do. These companies are famous for just kind of, all right, we're done with that. Let's leave that on in the in the dust, and we're going to move on with our lives. Um, anything, Carrie? Um, yeah, so <clears throat> there is actually one thing that could be like a surprise for all of us is that <clears throat> because it's Asus, they have the capability provided that AMD would also do it, is that Strix Halo could have a Z1 Extreme Pro Max version, like, mm -hmm. you know, the MacBooks do. Literally, mm -hmm. that's what the Mac is. Literally, more GPU and more bandwidth. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is what Halo Strix is. So, there is that possibility, right? Like, that could potentially happen. Uh, so, the, in that event, if there were an Asus RG Ally 2 with a Z2e Max Pro Schmax, it's going to be exceedingly more performant across the board. Uh, so that is one thing that I wish we could get. It's quite literally the same thing that I said. Strix Halo is pretty much the exact thing that I said what Microsoft should make for their handheld, hmm. essentially. Yeah. Uh, another quote that came out of this... And boy, IGN kind of, I don't like how they, how IGN did this. Uh, they, cause they were quoting this interview, I guess, over at tech exclusive and they said, uh, on the IGN website, it said he also told the outlet, meaning, uh, tech, tech lucive, um, that the ROG ally sold around 70 to 80,000 units. Which sounds really, really bad, right? Like, holy cow, that's very small. Of course, in the realm of handheld PCs, that's not that bad. That's pretty decent. Uh, Steam Deck uh, aside, because a lot yes. of these other these other devices just don't sell very many. But then I clicked through to the tech exclusive article or tech lucive. That's a, a terrible name, people. What are you doing here? Um, I clicked through their article, and it says that he said in India. We sold seventy to eighty thousand. Oh units. my goodness! That's a and huge I'm like, difference. right? That is a ridiculous <laughs> difference. I'm going to yeah. try and bring this bring this up. We'll see if it loads okay. It did not load okay. Um, it, like, why would IGN <laughs> leave that piece of information out? And it's like, it's not even. Yeah, here we go. I'm going to bring it up on screen now. Far, sorry, audio listeners. I know you're not looking at this. Um, yeah, it says right here, in India, we sold around 70 <laughs> oh to 80,000 units. <laughs> it is hilarious. Yeah, That's uh... just so bad. I, I, I was shocked that they did that. Because when I first saw it, I was like, ooh, 70 to 80,000. That's, that's yeah, way boy. lower than I thought that, that yeah. they would have sold. But that's just in India. What do you guys think the sell-through rate is for the ROG Ally? I mean, obviously, nobody knows. But, Russ, do you have any guesses? No. No idea. You know, but, you know, I'll tell you, like, I was walking through, it was either, like, Jogjakarta, Indonesia, or it was in Bali. One of those, I was in, a, like, a mall, and they had a little Asus booth, and there was an ROG Ally just sitting there. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, man, that's a f that's deep penetration into, like, the global market. If I'm in mm -hmm. just, like, a tiny little Southeast Asian city or country, you know, and I'm looking at just this random little booth and that has an ROG ally that is that is much further reach than most other handhelds that you can think of oh. absolutely Gary yeah um if i were to take a guess i would say that i would anticipate at least a million units for them to consider doing another one um 70 to 80,000 units when i first saw them, i'm like they're going to do another one <laughs> like that doesn't even sound right like that would be that's an utter failure that's a catastrophic failure for a company like asus to sell 70 or 80,000 like total but in india alone okay but i don't in like us and uk which 
would also be bigger markets. And then China as well, <clears throat> also being a very big market. Um, I would love to see those. So I would anticipate that actual units is probably around a million. Uh, if I had to take a guess. Yeah. Uh, they also said we're sticking with windows. So no chance of steam OS coming on this thing, which is too bad, but you know, mm. maybe someday we'll be able to install it. If valve, uh, if valve lets us Carrie has something you know, to say. The latest update that they came out with, with the, the ROG ally stuff, their, uh, armor, mm -hmm. armor crate, uh, it's, it's, it's good. Fixed a lot of things for me in in so far as like using windows on a handheld without a keyboard and mouse. They did a lot there that I found it to be more than adequate for getting around quickly closing a game, much like how Steam Deck does, but being in a Windows PC, uh, considering that we still don't have Game Pass on Steam Deck, which I think would be like if Microsoft doesn't make an Xbox handheld, they really got to figure out a way to get Game Pass working on Steam Deck because I think that would be a huge increase in numbers by itself. Uh, well, huge. At least 3 million people <laughs> would get <laughs> right. Game Game Pass or whatever that number is that already had. Yeah. But it's a, it's a really good service. So that is the one advantage that the Asus RG Ally has now is that you can play those Game Pass PC games on that device. And... In so far as it being a very handheld centric P Windows gaming PC, it's uh, with Armory Crate, the latest update, quite usable. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think, still think I, it's the most usable ahead. Windows interface. You know, the the thing that just drives me nuts is I'll be playing around and I'll be like, man, this thing is so great. Start up a game, just kind of. I do a lot more tinkering than I do actually playing, and then I look down and the battery's at sixty percent, and I'm like, oh. Yeah, like, and yeah. There, there, that was a great 25 minutes, but, you know, now mm -hmm. I've got to uh, have battery anxiety all over again. And yeah. so that's the thing that just bothers me about it. And so I hope they do refresh that battery size. That needs oh, to be a sure. shirt, by the way. Battery anxiety. <laughs> that's a really right. that's that's good. I'll work on that. people. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree with you guys that the like Armory Crate has improved leaps and bounds from when it first came out. But the problem has never really, for me, has never really been Armory Crate. There were things about it that I wasn't really a fan of. But what happens is when I go to launch a game, so, like, when it works, it works. But when it doesn't, then I'm stuck with this Windows interface, and it's a pain. And I have yeah. to, like, mess around with stuff. That's the one thing that I really don't like is when it works, it works. But when it doesn't, it's a very bad experience and i would say for me my favorite windows handheld right now is still the legion go and the one reason why has nothing to do with the gimmicky controllers that you could take off and do first person shooter stuff with i never take them off unless i'm transporting the device the the reason i like it so much is because it has that 8.8 .8 inch screen and all of the touch targets are bigger it's just easier to navigate windows when you have a big screen like that. So, uh, but we've said this on the show a thousand times, um, that, yeah. you know, Microsoft needs to pull their heads out of their rear ends and we'll talk about them more later. Um, they need to pull their heads out of their rear and just give us a good, um, a good user interface. I don't care if it's window. I don't care. Like windows is fine. It's just the UI is bad. And and there's all, all those people that are going to be like, whoa, Windows is bloated, blah, blah, blah. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I'm not going to sit here and argue about whether it's bloated or not. My problem for me is the UI. The UI is a uh, hot garbage on a stick, and I hate it. Um, and this Steam OS is just so much better of a user interface. And And then people will argue with me, and they'll say, well... But you got to use Linux, and if you don't know how to use Linux, no, because I don't go into desktop mode for almost anything on SteamOS. But on Windows, I have to be in desktop mode all the time. Like, I don't get mm. to choose. So that's just me. Uh, anything else about the ROG Ally 2 uh, with you guys? You know, my big thing is just like, ahead. I'm just not sure what what they're going to do, you know, like, uh, sure. OLED. Great. But don't take away my VRR because I need that, no, yeah. you know, and then also, you know, bigger battery life. But, uh, unless they make some sort of, uh, really phenomenal kind of change, uh, when it comes to the CPU and the processor and stuff, it's, it's not going to feel like an ROG ally too. It's going to feel like an yeah. ROG ally OLED, you know, like that or kind whatever. Of thing. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I'm I, not sure what know, else they can do. 
That's a good point. Let's so let's assume that the CPU the performance wise is going to be very similar. We'll just assume mm -hmm. that carry is right and the performance is going to be the same. So let's talk about what what should they change? Um, I'm going to say number one, they got to move the freaking uh, SD card port to somewhere <laughs> oh, else. Yeah, I think like that's like yeah, I mean <laughs> that's a huge thing, right? Like I think that's like number one kind of thing that everyone wants to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, move that somewhere else. Okay, so that's out of the way. Um, you know, Russ, you said OLED. Do you think that OLED is super important for you as an upgrade, or is that like a? It'll be nice because the panel, like 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 we said before, the panel on this is really nice already. Right, it's one of my favorite LCD panels, and so mm -hmm. yeah, I don't I I I get why the OLED people are going to be like, oh yeah, finally OLED. But man, that LCD panel is really great, and so it's not going to be a huge upgrade for me. Just you know, the biggest thing for me is that 120 hertz variable refresh rate. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's OLED. So on a handheld, OLED VRR is what everyone has been waiting for forever. So if you can, if you can get whatever it is, especially now that if they can support like how Armory Crate does 900p on that panel, which is a fantastic resolution to run the the panel at. If you can do 900p, uh, 120 frames a second with VRR or 144 uh, FPS mm -hmm. with VRR, now you're in a place where this is like premium that's absolutely premium and that is a worthwhile upgrade and you know like the things that you guys said as well is like they should consider upgrading the battery considerably because 40 watt hour oh yeah is uh even for steam deck was like a, a weird like uh, is there some weight limit that you guys are trying to like get under which is crazy too right because the steam deck oled has a 50 watt hour battery and it weighs less than the original steam deck so they got rid of some stuff increased battery which is uh, technically the heaviest part of any handheld there is. Uh, so increasing the battery while also lowering the total weight was uh, a feat. So I feel like Asus can do it, uh, but also, I don't know, maybe I'm just not the norm. I don't care if the, the device weighs a pound. It, that doesn't bother me. Uh, I don't know. There's that shirt that I have is like, do you even handheld, bro? Which is like right. an inside <laughs> joke. But uh, uh it, you know, I think most people, it's the same thing, right? Once when phones, the iPhone 4 was out, it was like the perfect size phone. And when the Galaxy Note 2 came out, everyone was like, ugh, that thing is huge and heavy. And now the iPhone 6 Pro Max is like a giganto phone. You know what I mean? And they just kept on making the phones just larger. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> yeah, and it's heavy. I, I could <laughs> not go back. Let's, well, yeah, we get used to, we you get used to heavier. Exactly. Um, I could not go back to a small phone. Exactly. <laughs> and it's, it's a thing that, what's a weird thing. So it's a quick anecdote. I was at my old office for two old jobs ago, but I was in the, the kitchen and I took out my Samsung Galaxy Note 2 and unsolicited, this girl is like, if my man ever pulled that out, we'd have to be over. Like, that's what she said. And I was like, you would like st stop dating a guy because he had a phone this large. Then like two years later or whatever, or three, three years later, she had the Giganto iPhone. And I was like, uh-huh. So now you see, right? <laughs> and that's the thing that I always find myself is like, I, again, this is kind of a, a, a rant, but I'm still waiting for a gaming phone. I wish AYN would make a gaming phone. But every time I talk about a gaming phone, they're like, why don't you just get a, an Android handheld and have your phone? And I'm like, guys, there's a million Android handhelds that are not phones. You guys are already s satisfied. There is no gaming phone. So why are you telling me no to a gaming phone when it doesn't exist? And you have <laughs> millions of things that you can choose from. Like, Get out of this conversation. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> a gaming phone needs to happen. At least one, please. I, I want I want one just for you, Carrie, but I'm not buying it. that with ever. I will never yeah. buy that. <laughs> Today. But once you realize, you're like, oh, you know, maybe if it is a little bit no. thicker. Yeah. You'll see. <laughs> no, thank you. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> podcast was recorded using Riverside. Riverside is a virtual studio that makes recording and editing at the highest quality possible accessible to anyone. I've been making podcasts and videos for years, and Riverside is by far the easiest way to do this. You simply send a link to your guest, click record, and Riverside does the rest. You can use Riverside to automatically write show notes for you based on what you said during the podcast. Find shareable moments in your show for social media, and they do it all at incredibly high quality. Plus, 
Editing is a breeze because they turn your conversation into text. So if you want to cut something, it's super simple. You highlight the text, you press delete. So if you want to use Riverside to make your own YouTube videos and podcasting a breeze, then check out the link down below. Um, well, all right, let's, uh, uh, so, okay. OLED screen, uh, is 120 Hertz important enough to you guys, or would you guys be happy? Oh. Like I like the 90 Hertz on the steam deck, 120 Hertz. I don't care about nearly as much. I know that the right enough panel. I definitely want 120 Hertz cause it has that black frame insertion. Oh, that you that's can work right. With. I always yeah. forget so, about the BFI. Yeah. So that's the sweet spot for me, at least, uh, when it comes to playing that, uh, retro gaming and stuff, but it has to be a bright enough panel and the allies is. And so, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the big takeaway there. Cause it does like reduce your brightness by half basically when you play that way and also uh bfi on oleds is superior to lcds um yeah these black, black frames are literally nothing they just turn off like right so yeah. it just it look it oh bfi on oleds just look the image clarity motion clarity is just way superior even though on the ssr gli it is still very good yeah that's definitely something i i keep wanting to check that out you know what i would really like I would like a panel on, like, this is my mm -hmm. Miu Mini Plus. I would like to get a panel on my Miu Mini Plus that has, uh, that, that has the, the frame rate that can go high enough so that I could get BFI on this little screen. I don't know how battery sucking that would be, but God, that either. would look really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, technically speaking, it would all just be on the panel itself and the backlight. The backlight is going to be your biggest draw for an LCD. So it really depends on how far you're pushing that backlight to compensate for the BFI part on the LCD to overcompensate for the diminished brightness from inserting black frames into there. So yeah. that is really all that would happen is uh, the refresh rate doesn't really do anything for power wise. It's the backlight that is going to be your biggest power draw. All right. Well, me, you get on it. I will buy another thing. Okay. <laughs> That's all I want. Um, speaking of buying more things that we finally have some, finally, we've been having rumors for the Nintendo switch Two for seven damn years, or as Carrie likes <laughs> to call it the super switch. And, um, we got this uh, rumor that was posted on Twitter from Wario 64 and he's, uh, quoting Bloomberg. Uh, and he's basically saying, Hey, it looks like we're going to be getting a new Nintendo Switch this year. It's going to have an 8-inch LCD screen, according to Omida analyst Hiroshi Hayase. And if I pronounce that wrong, I'm sure that uh, Russ will correct me because uh, good I, me. I did okay. All right, thanks. Um, so first off, that is a very surprising thing for them to say because Nintendo... You know, they brought out the OLED Nintendo Switch, and everybody was like, oh, my God, it's just so freaking good. And it it is. It's a gorgeous screen. And um, using the OLED Switch, I, I was like, well, I think everything's everything's OLED going forward, right? And then the Steam Deck <laughs> came out, and then the Steam Deck brought out the OLED version. I'm like, yeah, see, everything's going, going OLED as we move forward. And now Nintendo is bringing out an 8-inch LCD screen. Mm -hmm. So here's the first question. I don't want to get it into the weeds on whether or not... Um, I don't want to get too far away from this question yet. Does the fact that they say it's an 8-inch LCD screen make you doubt this report? Carrie? No, I, I believe it. Okay, Russ? Yeah, I I've got reasons why I I think it's a dumb move, but it doesn't make me doubt the report. Okay, so now let's assume that the report is true. <clears throat> Eight inch LCD screen. Um, so that's kind of like right between the OLED Steam Deck and the Lenovo Legion Go, which has an eight point eight inch screen. The OLED Steam Deck has a seven point five inch screen, right? Is it uh, 7.5? Like 7 7.4 or something. 7.4? Yeah. Okay. So it's like right in between those two. What do you think about an 8-inch screen for the Super Switch? Is Are, are you excited about that? Or, or do you feel like that's too big? You Like you don't want to have something that bulky? Fox? Uh, yeah. So uh, the one thing that I hope 
and I don't know if this is going to be the truth, the, the case. If they were to do 8 inch, um, I have to measure it again, but if they were able to do it like bezel-less inside of the same form factor as a switch so that they could maintain using the same Joy-Cons, that is something that I would love because I know that there's a lot of people that have a bunch of Joy-Cons that they would love to just kind of like continue using on the Super Switch. I don't know if that's going to be the case. It could be the case that they just have entirely new Joy-Cons so that they can sell new things, which sounds very Nintendo-like of them to do. Yeah. So mm-hmm. with that whole caveat, the I think the size of the Switch is something that everyone kind of already is like, yeah, that's a good size. So if we were to max that out, that means that the res- the aspect ratio would not be 16 by 9. It would be some other aspect ratio to kind of like be a bezel thing inside of that whole tablet space. I don't know if that's going to be eight inches, but um, yeah, it's or if they just redesign the tablet itself to be, you know, eight inches, 16 by nine and just make it wider or whatever. Um, yeah, I I am. Um, I am a big fan of it overall. And uh, the LCD part just makes me even further believe that it's true just because that's that's the Nintendo playbook. Right. Like Ooh. the three the 3DS comes out, then the uh, 3DS XL comes out and then the 2DS comes out. And they just they just keep on pivoting in different structures to just resell you the same thing in in like the same the same basic stuff, but just resell it to you in the new version, right? So that's just the Nintendo playbook. I mean, they got me with the Nintendo playbook doing that. I bought yeah. the original Switch when it first came out, and then the first revision. I don't remember it like it was HB zero one to HB zero zero one or something like that, um, which had a more efficient chip in it which didn't give you more power but it used less uh, used less battery so you had a better battery life i ended up upgrading at that point and then i ended up buying the oled switch so i ended i mean outside of you know buying one for my son i bought three nintendo switches just for me yeah so they they got (laughs) and yeah so they're gonna get a rusty do you think that that that's what they're doing here? Is they're going to ship this? I'll call it Super Switch. Otherwise, Carrie will come after me. Um, they'll come out. They'll, they'll bring out this Super Switch with an eight-inch LCD screen, and in three years, we'll see the Super Switch OLED. Yeah, I, I that's the thing that I, the Rye, I think the LCD is kind of a bad move. That I get that's their playbook, but man, how many people are going to be able to say, "I'm just going to wait for the OLED version"? You know, like that's that's an argument that now is part of that discourse that really didn't have to be there it would be a very pro consumer move for them just to make yes. the oled right now and i can see why they're not doing it but man i wish they they would you know speaking of the eight inches though so i have a couple handhelds that are exactly eight inches but they're 16 by 10 aspect ratio so the original aok zoe a1 uh was an eight inch 10, 16 by 10 and it is a more immersive experience compared to like something like the steam deck i remember that feeling when i was reviewing it after already owning a steam deck where i was like man this is more immersive just because it's like an extra inch but man playing like a game like destiny 2 on it was just so much better and so uh i do i do like the fact they're going to eight inches i don't think it'd be too big uh i i would i would also find it pretty cool if they did something that wasn't 16 by 9 but i'm not really sure considering the fact that all the original switch games were so we'll see Uh, Well, as far as, you know, the aspect ratio, 16 by 9 versus 16 by 10, I can see a couple of reasons why they would want to go 16 16 by 10. Um, First off, like backwards compatibility with the Nintendo Switch, if that does happen, um, you know, a black bar on the top and bottom, not not that not really that big of a deal, Um, especially well on an OLED system. It's really not that big of a deal on an LCD. It's a little bit more big of a deal because you can see it. Um, that being said, you know, Russ, as Mr. Retro man, you know, 16 by 10 is better. And Nintendo has been building that Nintendo switch online, um, library of, you know, you have your subscription so you can play all these old games. They would look better on that 16 by 10 inch display. So including GameCube, if they were able to bring that as part of the switch too. Yeah. What would you say? I say including GameCube. If they bring that as part of the Switch too, they're like, hey, this thing's more powerful. We're also going to bring GameCube to our Nintendo Switch online catalog. That'd be cool. And those mostly played in four by three. So that'd be great. Yeah. 
Well, and not only that, I mean, I think I saw recently that Nintendo was doing some trademark stuff with GameCube over in England. Uh, this was like last week or the week before. And of course, everybody always is like, oh my God, what's happening? We're going to, but they could just be saying, well, we have to refresh the trademark in order to keep like the mm. lawyers going to lawyer, you know? Um, but it could, it, it could be related to this with, you know, 16 by 10 uh, on that, that new eight inch screen using you know you're playing the old gamecube games not all the gamecube games just the ones that nintendo is nice enough to give you because they're a bunch of jerks about that um hmm. but i think that that's pretty compelling and and i can see nintendo selling it in that way but it also does make the system taller and that makes it harder to be Joy-Con compatible. Although right. personally, I hope that they completely ditch the Joy Cons and have something, some other thing, because I think that the Joy Cons are like they're just not comfortable to play. Totally. Um, yeah. Go ahead. So the one thing that um, I I do feel like what Russ is saying would be a general sentiment is like, oh well, I'll just wait for the Super Switch OLED version. But then <clears throat> there's that one group in Nintendo that are just uh, economic wizards that <laughs> just know is like, okay, if we make exactly this amount of units, they're going to sell out uh, within uh, about 13 hours. And then everyone's going to have FOMO like crazy. Uh, and then they won't care that there's not an OLED mo model <laughs> right. because they're going to be scrambling to get what we give them. And Nintendo... Mm -hmm. Has this system so perfectly calibrated? I think the only thing that they ever messed up on, like well, the Wii U was a big mess up, but that was a, a different thing. And I don't think those guys can fix. But you have like the Amiibos for Animal Crossing where they made way too many of those things. Like they <laughs> over anticipated how many of those are going to be. And then they had to like fire sale them because there was too many of them. I think it's like the only time that they've ever like truly like mis made a miscalculation on how much to produce of something. But yeah, I think like the, the Super Switch, uh, when it comes out, it's just going to be a thing that everyone scrambles for, and then the pre-order is going to sell out, and then everyone's going to be like, oh, where do I get this thing? And everyone's concerns of the pre the new model is just going to, whatever, I just need to get this. Right. Yeah, it's well, going to be the games, you know, like the yeah. when Metroid Prime 4 becomes the launch title. Exactly. Yeah, fingers like, crossed then yeah I can, I can see a lot dude, of people buying it. Yeah, it's just like, oh, they got me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's always the games. Like, the Nintendo yeah. Switch, like, it didn't have hard. It had hardly. No, it had no games. I think there were seven games at launch or something like that. But Breath of the and Wild was huge. Yeah, everybody. All of the third part, like the the Wii came out. Everybody kind of ignored Nintendo. The Wii sold like crazy. So all the third party companies were like, "Okay, we're going to make a bunch of shovelware. We'll make as much as we can for the Wii." Yeah. Then the Wii U gets announced, and they were like, "All right, the Wii U launched with I think, I think it was thirty two launch titles which is crazy because third parties were like oh nintendo kind of has it they they nailed it last time we're going to support them and then the wii u sold 14.7 million units worldwide lifetime so everybody was like oh nintendo is gone they're dead they've they they can't do anything so when the switch comes out seven titles like no third party support but one of those games was Breath of the Wild with over 100% attach rate. Yeah. And so everybody was talking about this game, and it just flew off the shelves. People couldn't get the Switch fast enough. And because of that, all of these, you know, the third parties turned around again. And so I imagine that whatever this system is, it's going to launch with lots of games. And it's going to launch with something big from Nintendo. For sure. So it's going to sell very, very well. I think Nintendo has captured lightning in a bottle. And all they have to do is not screw up. Yeah. Like, they have the, the mind space of, of, the, of the gaming in, um, audience right now. They've captured them. So all they have to do is not screw up. They screwed up last time with the Wii U. We'll see what happens uh, with the Nintendo Switch or the Super Switch or whatever, whatever it is that we want to end up that they end up calling it. But you know, I want to go back to what Russ was saying about the people who are like, "I'm just going to wait for the OLED version." I think the number of people, like, if you just walked, if you stood outside of a GameStop and you asked the people walking in and out of there, um, 
do you know what OLED is? I think <laughs> most of them would be like, uh, no, I, I don't know. They just they just go in and buy a game and they play it. They don't really care. The people who really care about that are a very small section of the industry. And I just don't see that those people who really care about OLED, who I'm one of them, um, I don't see those people waiting, like making a big enough of a difference for Nintendo to really just consider. You know what I mean? Yeah. The problem is that all of those folks are online. And so that's it makes it seem it's like it's larger, you know. It's almost yeah. like I'm I'm just kind of pre annoyed about the comments that I'm gonna see <laughs> of people saying, I'll just wait for the OLED version. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because we're gonna see it a bunch. You know, yeah, it doesn't yeah, necessarily mean that's the reality of it, but man, I'm just yeah, I'm I'm pre annoyed of it. Yeah, it is fascinating, like when uh you realize how like if you're just surrounded by the ultra hardcore, your perception of what's going on is different. Mm. But there is a small anecdote about that. When you ask people what OLED is, they wouldn't know. When the Wii was coming out, they had a demo station up in a GameStop, and I was there. And a dude comes up and gets up to him and goes, Nintendo, why? He mispronounced the Wii. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's pretty, that's pretty accurate. Nintendo, yeah. why? <laughs> Nintendo, why? <laughs> oh my god that is uh yeah. that's a shirt coming soon to fox's youtube channel the nintendo y that's fantastic uh well speaking of oled um you know carrie you've been doing your your oled test for the steam deck it's sitting back there uh behind you and uh you know i'm curious how long how many hours has it been so far so it's around 500 hours. I'm going to do like, <clears throat> I'm just going to terminal into it. I've disabled the, the Wi-Fi in there, um, but I'm going to have to re-enable it when I take it out. I've taken a peek at it and there's some surprising results. So when I do an off-time result, I'll be able to get a more accurate reading of how long it's been running. Uh, but it's around 500 hours at this point, February 11th. I had marked on my calendar as the 1000 hour mark when I was going to do my first video on it. But I took a peek because I just wanted to see. I was like, is a thousand hours too long? Like, can I see anything right now? And I can. I can already see uh, burn in. It, uh, bit burn in is a, this is a large semantics thing. And you're going to get people that are overly technical saying that it's not burn in. It is indeed not burn in. It's image retention. Uh, I, I want to pause real quick. And, and I just want to point <laughs> out the idea that Carrie would say that somebody is going to get overly technical <laughs> is one of the funniest <laughs> things that's ever happened on this show. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so it's uh, it, effectively it doesn't matter, right? People are going to say burn in because when you're looking at something, there is a noticeable after image that is a ghost like on the screen. Burn in uh, technically is actually burning in. So you saw this on plasmas, you saw this on CRTs, uh, CRT that had the same thing shown over. When you turn off the the monitor, you can still see the image burned in to the screen. So that's burn in. This is uh, an image retention uh, issue. Effectively, the uh, OLED pixels, because they're self-emissive, they are less emissive because I've been overusing them. So what we're seeing is like the rest of the screen is able to outperform the stuff that's always been displayed. So you can mm. see this outline of because it's not able to push to the same level as the other pixels that are currently off all the black stuff. So that's what we're what we're seeing. We're seeing uh, an image retention issue. Um, now, can I uh, try to fix that? There are some methods that we can try to do to try to like uh, hopefully fix the image somehow. So I'll try to power off the device, power back on, use some online tools to try to like do something with the surrounding pixels to see if I can fix it. But as it is right now, when I go to the menu, um, you can you can see it. Um, you can see the outline of it. So, you know, Bob uh, Wolf, uh, he's been on the show before. He he did the same test that you're doing. Well, okay, that's that's not true. No. You're doing a real test. Nothing against Bob. He he was doing this on the Switch. He can't really do a, a real test. He just turned it on in Breath of the Wild, a screenshot of Breath of the Wild. Right. And left yeah. it on to see what would happen. Your test is way more rigorous, right? So, yeah, my test is uh, able to uh, work in HDR mode where it wouldn't be able to otherwise with just a single screenshot. For what it's worth, what Bob did was fine because he had like very high contrast. So you had a white that's going right. to be mm -hmm. pushing uh, uh, RGB to its max. Uh, so effectively, what he did was fine. 
uh, especially because whatever that panel can do would be what it's going to do. So um, I, I think with Bob, Bob Wolf's test was fine. It's just that um, the brightness that can go on the swole LED is obviously not as bright as what the Steam Deck OLED can do. And because this is the first panel that can, uh, handheld panel that can do o, uh, HDR on OLED, you know, the difference in power is like if you were to do all white on this, on a SDR, at full brightness, that's about two watts. And if you go to HDR, it's five watts. So you're looking at like two and a half times more power being pushed through the panel in HDR full max. So that is the, that's a large difference. That's a, you know, a gi ginormous difference between these two panels. And that's what my test does is my test actually does SDR and HDR. And we can see differences between the two of them, even at 500 hours. Um, so the, the, the HDR stuff that I'm pushing it has a, a more pronounced uh ghost like image when mm -hmm. you're looking around uh the one thing that i have to like kind of be very mindful to say is that the test that i did is uh almost perfectly done to ruin the panel like as much as i possibly can um and because we can push the panel so hard i'm able to exacerbate it and game scope as far as i know does not have any type of um uh, pixel orbiting uh, type of stuff or moving, shifting the pixels just even a little bit over time, which is what a lot of OLED panels do. And there's a lot of like Android OLED phones. You may not notice it, but like when you have the clock symbol at the top, it's moving. It's if you were to put it like on time lapse, you'd see that thing just kind of scrolling back and forth. And that's to prevent, uh, you seeing any type of, uh, clock that is with image retention on OLED phones. So there's lots of things that Android does with OLED phones to mitigate burn uh burn in issues uh whereas the steam deck doesn't seem to have that so we'll have to see if valve maybe tries to be cognizant of that and try to incorporate uh you know image image uh, uh pixel orbiting techniques that people can enable or disable if they wanted uh which might be a, a one effective way to combat any type of burn in so right now Again, this is saying a lot of words, but I need to preface this is that I made a test that is destroying my panel, and I did. So congratulations to me. I said, <laughs> I did what I set out to do. Check. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, and could, just real quick, comparing your test to Bob's test, Bob is, you know, he's playing a game that doesn't really give him the option to shut off. Yes pixels you like if we look in the background i don't know if the in the edit if it's going to show over the shoulder or if russ and i's faces are going to cover it up uh but basically what's happening is carrie has parts of his screen turned on and parts of his screen turned off which you can do with oled you can't do that on a switch because carrie had the option to make a game that gave him the ability to do this on all Bob could really do is take a good screenshot for his and test it because Nintendo is way more locked down. Yeah. And yeah, he's showing us now. You can see the black parts of the screen. Those have never, they're not on. So can you see it? Can you yeah, see? Yeah, we can see it. Right there. It's a little small for me, but I'll believe you. Yeah. <laughs> If I remember, I'm going to try and zoom in on in in post to see this. Here, let me get to the desktop because right now you're only taking a look at the SDR stuff. So hopefully, make sure that oh. you talk while you're showing this so that it puts the screen on you. Okay, so in the black part of it up here, uh, let me go over here. Right over here, you can see HDR 1000, and then over here we have SDR. It may be hard to see if you can zoom in, you would see it, but it is already apparent that it's there. That's crazy. And you've got a video that came out, by the time you're watching this, it either came out yesterday or earlier today. Yeah, I'm going to have I'm gonna have this out on Monday. What's interesting is that because I did uh, red, green, and blue, you can actually see um, those pixels not able to uh, push to the same uh max that it could before so you have this like pixel dif uh, differential like so it, it uh the after image is kind of like has like a green hue to it or a blue hue to it or a red hue to it because of the one sub pixel that i'm not using right like so or the two mm -hmm. sub pixels that i'm not using you're seeing the inverse of what it's able to do it's pretty interesting but yeah uh even even on here you can see what's going on if i could try to show 
uh, something that's like a little bit brighter. D- D- Russ, does this make you consider? Does this make you worry at all about your? Um, what the, I can hear the little <laughs> sound effects. Does this make you wonder at all about the? You know how your OLED Steam Deck, Russ? No, not at all. I mean, I, I just use it in a regular use case, you know. And so, I the thing is to get to that point would probably take me ten years of playing something that's very static, and mm-hmm. uh, I don't plan on playing my Steam Deck for ten years. There'll be there'll be another Steam Deck by then, hopefully. So. Talk when you're showing us something, Carrie, so that it'll, yeah. so that a camera will focus on you. I'm I, I'm trying to I'm trying to get this so that you guys can see it. I think we're just gonna have to like zoom in, and I, I could you know just I'd have to get in close, but my my camera is like fixed focus right now. Uh, yeah, I don't, I'd have to get this closer. It's oh, that's it's, okay. It's, it's outrageously apparent to me right here. Once I get it, once you see it in the video, it's yeah. uh it's very apparent. And we'll link the video down below uh, in the show notes so that people can can get there easily because I think that's a, it's an interesting video and there's going to be a lot of comments. Hey, uh, Russ, what are the comments that are going to pre annoy you? <laughs> <laughs> this could be, yeah, I was, and you know, it's going to be people like, oh, see, the Lenovo Legion Go is better, you know, those kind of <laughs> things. Like, come on, man, it's like just one tiny test, you know, for something, and the whole spectrum of things involved in a handheld. You know, there'll always be people who just kind of focus on those things, and you know, it's great. I mean, if that's what bothers them, you know, is the fear of burning, then sure. I get that, you know, but mm-hmm. uh, I think this is a pretty good demonstration that you have to go to some pretty extreme, extreme. lengths yes. to get that. Yeah, but. it's uh, I don't that's the thing I don't want people to walk away from here is that this is going to be like they have to have doom and gloom, worry about what type of brightness that they're running on their screen. Um, <clears throat> I will say that there's one thing here that Valve could do, and I, I don't know if they do it just yet, but because the device needs to be on while you're downloading games, it would be beneficial if it could like automatically like just go to the lowest brightness while it's sitting there just downloading nothing. Like you're not doing anything with it and there's no reason for the display to be at like 75 or whatever brightness. Right. It should auto dim the screen at the very least to as low as possible. I think that's like a, a worthwhile mitigation that they could implement. Uh, and technically it should be for the LCD as well because there's no reason to be just chewing up like an extra watt or whatever. Like, yeah, just lower it. Dim it. I just, so when uh, I got the OLED deck, um, I didn't install my retro stuff until just last week. Right. And so that means, and for some reason, my scrapes, they were gone. So I had to rescrape, which is always so fun. So, uh, I set it up and I had it, you know, uh, going to scraping all of it. For those of you who don't do retro stuff, scraping is where, um, the device is going out on the internet, going to a certain websites, finding art for your retro games and downloading that. So that when you are looking at the front end, uh, it's, you know, instead of just seeing a, an ugly list of games, you see all of the art that's associated with those games. If you set it up right you can just kind of look at it for a second and then it'll bring up a video of the game all that stuff so i was scraping uh my retro games and i had to have it sitting there and it basically sat there on for two days while it was scraping through all of the stuff that i wanted to have and i don't understand why there's not a way maybe one of you guys can explain technically that there's no good way to do this why can't they just shut off the damn screen when it's mm-hmm. like, is there a reason? Uh, no, no, they, they well, <clears throat> in Windows, you can. In Windows, there's a command that you can send, uh, which is always a power CFG command. INEO and their ISPACE 2 actually have this uh, single command that you can just press a button and it'll turn off the screen and you can still download in the background. For all intents and purposes, it's just turning the display off and yeah. the system's still running. Yeah. I would love it if I could hit the button on my screen and have it say, do you want to shut the shut the system? Do you want to put the system to sleep or do you want to put the display to sleep? And then I could I could put pick one and then have that happen while it's downloading games. Yeah. So this yeah. would be it. Technically, it should be possible because uh, if I'm uh, correct here, this is a part of the Acme table. Um, so um, the, this, the standards for laptops and stuff. There is a, in Windows, you could do uh, like screensaver mode. You can have it just disable the screen, 
that's the command that you're sending to the thing. Instead of waiting a minute for it to just dis disable the screen, you're just forcing that command in, and it's just going to the ACME table saying, disable the screen, and the screen turns off. Uh, that should technically be possible on Linux. Oh, okay. All right, uh, let's move on to... Um... So do you guys want to talk about the App Store or do you want to talk about Xbox uh, layoffs? Which one do you want Ooh. to hit? Because I don't know if we have time for both. Up to you guys. Uh, let's talk about the layoffs. Okay, let's hit those layoffs. So Microsoft, <clears throat> there's two terrible. First off, they just hit the most valuable company in the world. They yeah. surpassed Apple as the most valuable company in the world. And then like the same week... They laid off 1,900 employees from Activision Blizzard, um, both from, like, a user support and some devs uh, and, like, anybody who was in charge of physical releases as, as well, which is crazy to me. Um, I put out a video. I kind of talked about what I thought was a hot take that, you know, I understand that they have two people that do the same, like you get somebody doing this job in this company, you get somebody doing this job in this company, one company buys the other, now you won't only need one person to do that job. The, I do understand that. Um, but at the same time, you know, you, you go back to when Nintendo launched the Wii U and it bombed so hard that Satoru Iwata said, I'm not going to get paid this year. And uh, Shigeru Miyamoto cut his pay by 70% and a bunch of other executives at Nintendo. They cut their pay and kept the employees. And to me, that makes a lot of sense because that means that, you know, the devs and the people who work there, they're going to do a better job and they're not going to be looking elsewhere for a job because they feel like the company is loyal to them. Whereas if I'm working... Even if I didn't get laid off, if I worked at Activ Activision Blizzard after today, I would be like, yeah, I'm looking somewhere else because I could be next on the chopping block. Uh, Russ, you said you wanted to talk about this story. What What are your thoughts on it? Uh, so like with everything, I've got multiple minds about it. But the first is just, yeah, like that sucks. I don't want to ever... I don't ever want to work in a place where I feel like my job just might be in jeopardy because of the decisions of somebody higher up, you know, uh, and, and maybe I'm very sensitive to it because of my, you know, nearly 23 years in the military where that just wasn't a thing we thought about. You know what I mean? I never thought about, oh, am I going to get fired? It's more about when am I going to leave? You know, that kind of thing. But I think the gaming industry in general is a little bit more transient, like just in observing Twitter and stuff, you see a lot of like former and then they put like five different companies in their like, title, <laughs> right. in their bio, you know? So I think that there is this transient kind of idea in, in game development. So uh, it, it hurts, you know, thinking about that. And I'd hate to be in a position where I feel like I might lose my job. Uh, it, it, no fault of my own, just because of restructuring or whatnot. The other mind that I have about it is that it might be overall more beneficial for the gaming industry because all of these people with all these talents that were let go, not because of the lack of talent, but because of just restructuring, they all need to find jobs. And think of all the companies and indie game studios and stuff that are going to crop up because of this, uh, where they're going to be better now because they're getting, you know, Xbox and Activision employees. And so I like the, the idea that talent is getting spread out throughout the industry a little bit more, uh, just because these people need to find work. Um, but that's a very like long look. We're talking like three years from now, there might be some benefit to it. So those are the kind of the two minds I have. It really sucks, but then I'm hoping, you know, there's this kind of wish that I have that maybe some new studio is going to crop up. Uh, we're going to get some pretty cool indie games out of it or something. I think it's possible, but I also think it's unlikely that that happens because a lot of times when an indie studio pops up, it's because somebody was just very successful doing something. They got a windfall from that and they said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take this cash and I'm going to try and make my own company. Whereas in this, these are just people who like, they basically just got fired. They got some severance, but like, they're just probably going to go looking for another job. And we, we had in the dev space, uh, we had riot games, just fired a bunch of people or laid off. I don't like saying fired. They laid off a bunch of people, discord, Twitch. I mean, like, 2023 was a nightmare for devs 
because just so many people got fired. And now we got another 1900 on top of that. Um, so I, I don't know that we'll see a bunch of indie studios. I think they'll just end up like some people will just exit the gaming industry and start doing other mm. development work. Um, but I hope I'm wrong about that. What do you think about this, Carrie? Uh, so I'm glad we talked about this just because this is a a bigger problem than just game dev. The tech space that I work in as well has uh, this has been a problem in general. And, you know, what we're seeing, you know, I, I again, I'm not an economist, but what I look at is like inflation rate is super high. A McChicken in 2019 was a dollar and today it's two dollars and eighty nine cents. So that's a that's a that's a big increase uh, in terms of what, how much stuff costs. So inflation is higher, and we're getting lots of layoffs from everything, not just game devs, but a lot of tech sector places. You look at it. There's, I mean, almost like a. It's got to be like a hundred thousand between Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, just tech jobs in general. And you look at these companies that you know the thing that really sucks for the Activision side of things was they force this mandate of like, no, you need to come to California and you're going to come to work every day uh, and we're going to fire you next month. Like, why go through that entire thing? And I know why they do it, because uh, you have places, other places that are not game dev, tell, making this five day work week comebacks after COVID happened, when COVID, re you know, created the idea that, hey, we don't actually need to come in all the time. We can actually work from home and get our stuff done. And that exists and can be possible. But one of the things that companies are doing, uh, are mandating five day work weeks is they are hoping for more attrition. They want people to leave on their own accord without having to pay for severance. They want people to say, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to go find something else because they, they're fed up. And for them, that's a bonus for a company, for a person to make up their own mind to leave. Um, so there's lots of things to do it. You know, you have <clears throat> talked about Satoru Rawada you know, uh, the executives there, uh, taking a pay cut, which is what you want to see, because if the executives made a decision and they failed, it should be on them and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be rolling downhill. And you look at what Embracer group has done and they've been, they've acquired a bunch of companies. And then the Saudi Arabia thing that came along said, Oh, actually, we're not going to buy it. And then they were like, Oh no, <laughs> we're left holding the bag. And they're still slashing and burning. They're still slashing yeah. and burning a lot of different stuff. And that's a fault on them, not on these companies that they acquired. That's a hundred percent on them. And it's not like overlap of positions. That's just, they made a bad decision. And now the, everyone that's underneath is, is facing the consequences of that. That's messed up. Uh, whereas the Activision Blizzard thing, you could kind of say, well, yeah, I could see the overlap for marketing and PR and all that other stuff. It still sucks. And I don't, th you know, you're still in relationship with, oh, Microsoft just caught across the $3 trillion mark. And I know it's not liquid money, but still, that's a tremendous, outrageous amount of money that it's almost might as well be infinite. So at some point, you have to kind of weigh these things and we're this is a greater conversation as it is, but what we're seeing is inflation is, uh, inflation is very high. Um, jobs are going down. These mega companies are incentivized to acquire because the more they acquire, they can get loans easier because the value of their company goes up. So business banks are giving loans for that, but banks aren't giving loans for money because interest rates are too high. So inflation's high, interest rates too high. Uh, money's expensive. Money's expensive in both ways. So what we're seeing is this attrition of people. These companies buying other companies, getting more mega conglomerate. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing just big companies being able to get bigger, smaller companies getting snuffed out. And it's a general problem. And it's, uh, you know, uh, where I work right now, I'm working like six days a week and I get, I get paid fine. But like, I worry about it because like, I'm like, I got to just make sure I save up enough money so that I could like withstand anything that happens. And that's where I am right now. And, uh, you know, I'm fine with that. But, like, it's tough. It's tough. And I, I wish, I, I would hope that all these people that, you know, it's how do you tell them to save when they're forced to come back to California to possibly rent or whatever? And they might be just getting by paycheck to paycheck. So when they get fired, there is no nest egg that they can say, you know, let me make an indie game studio. And maybe some of them can. But I'm, I'm agreeing with Russ is that, like, you look at this stuff and, like, man, there's some, like, mega talent that is just there. And if they just group together, they could knock something out of the park. Um, but it's that's a tough ask. That's a tough ask to do because you need all of them to basically work for free. 
and get something out the door so that they right. can reap the benefits of that. It's it's tough. And there's a larger conversation we need to have about this that effectively we're in a recession that no one's talking about. And uh, yeah. that's, you know, that's the problem. So one thing that maybe could have been a win-win is if Microsoft Activision had said, you know what, we're going to create our own sub studio. Yes. We're going to take an IP that we already own, yeah. you know, and we're going to, we're going to revitalize this new game and we're going to pull all these For people, sure. these 1900 people and create a new like Santa Monica studio kind yeah. of thing. You know what I mean? And that would have been amazing. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, now they're just kind of like leaving it up to them instead. And yeah. They could have done that multiple times because they just acquired a boatload of IP. IP. Like exactly. they have so much IP yeah. that is just sitting there. And yeah. then on top of that, they took this game, this survival game that Blizzard was working on for six years yeah, it's... and threw it in the trash. I mean, mm. that doesn't mean it won't ever come out. Uh, we've seen Blizzard do this before. They were working on what was essentially the sequel to World of Warcraft. And or, like it was in that and it ended up becoming Overwatch after they decided to shut that down. So maybe that will happen. But like after six years of development, um, you know, they said it had something to do with the engine. <laughs> so, you know, there's that one thing that seems crazy to me that doesn't make sense to anyone. Like, you you look at Warner Brothers, right? It's like, oh, yeah, that Catwoman uh, movie we made. We did the whole thing. It's completely done. Uh, we're not going to release it. Instead, we're going to make a tax break out of it. And it's like, yeah. what? <laughs> like, you get a tax break for making a movie and then not releasing it? Like, that's more profitable? Like, something is wrong. Something is just flat out wrong. And things need to... Things really need to change because perhaps maybe this could be a tax write-off for Microsoft, right? Like this is, oh, you know, we're going to make more money if we just cancel this. Uh, well, and it could be like, I mean, they're doing this in January. It, like me, I don't know when their fiscal year is, but think, it, yeah, it's, it's it, like it might have some. It might have something to do with that kind of thing too. Yeah. Like just there's a lot of businessy stuff that yeah. I don't really understand or know anything yeah. about, but there's Makes a no strategic. Sense. Yeah, there's a strategic reason why certain yeah. things happen in the industry at certain times of the year. Yeah. Yeah, it's a thing that, uh, for all intents and purposes, makes no sense. But because of the rules and laws and how everything is aligned, it does actually make sense. And it's 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 it shouldn't exist, but it does because of how everything's written. And people are just leveraging all of those things to uh, create a windfall. Like, right, this is a benefit for us to cancel this and do the, all this. So right. that's that's how things actually wind up happening. But when you tell someone just, oh, yeah, we, we had 2,000 people working on a product for six years. We're getting rid of it. Like, wow, that just seems terrible. That, that seems like a big waste of money. Well, like, just real quick, they didn't have, like, all those people were not working on that particular right. game. I think there were, like, yeah. 150 people working on that that, that uh, survival game. Right, but there's still some number of yeah. dollars that was invested into this project that was multi-millions, and it just, mm -hmm. just poof, like, just gone. It's like factions, right? Fa Last of Us factions. Uh, they were working on it for whoever knows how long, and it's all gone. Uh, yeah. so yeah, somehow, some way these companies get a write off in this because they, they invested into it and nothing will happen with it and they get to put it, those numbers somewhere and something good comes out of it. Yeah. yeah. I like to call people who do that kind of thing, spreadsheeters. Yeah. Like they just move in <laughs> numbers around until the number on the, on the right turns red or turns, turns from red to black. Uh, well, anyway. Boy, that kind of ended the show on a bad note. <laughs> uh, you know what? Let's talk about the App Store very, very quickly. This will be like a lightning round. Um, for those of you that don't know, this channel, uh, my YouTube channel, started out as a podcast about Stadia. And when Stadia came out, like there was this big kerfuffle because Apple said, you can't make an app and put it on our store. And their reasoning was the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And I, I'm saying this... As an Apple fan, I got my iPhone there. I'm, we're recording this on my MacBook. Um, it was a stupid reason. They were like, well, we want to be able to review every game that's on your service so that we can like put like a little, you know, this is E for everyone or, you know, their, their little rating about who each game is for, which is a stupid argument because they don't do that for Netflix or HBO or any of those other things. Well, Apple has... They, they've decided, you know what, we're going to go ahead and allow um, the, the App Store 
to bring in things like Stadia if Google had the intestinal fortitude to stick it out because <laughs> they gave up uh, real quick. Um, but things like Xbox Cloud Gaming, GeForce Now are no longer going to be these web apps. They're going to actually be able to be apps that you can just download from the store. And that that, that makes it a much easier way to use these things. Russ, you use a lot of like you have a lot of those telescopic controllers that you put on your on yep. your phone. I've used like two of them. I've used the Backbone and I've used a Game Sir, uh, one of the older Game Sirs. I don't remember which mm, one it is, two. but yeah, maybe I'm not sure. Um, and then I've used the Backbone, and it's an actually it's it's a pretty cool uh, way to play. And now being able to install an app and just have it work with all this stuff See, sounds really cool are you interested in this stuff at all russ you know when i first heard the news i was like i thought you could already do that but that's because i've already just shifted over to use it on android handhelds and and, and phones instead you know what i mean and so mm -hmm. they are definitely already there i think that you know i have used the web apps before especially the xbox one you know you like make a little safari page and then you say add to your home screen and then it's basically there uh the thing is like the people who like are tech savvy enough to make those web apps uh like i probably don't care you know what i mean like so there's going to be a new audience maybe where they're like oh now there's the xbox app available for me you know mm -hmm. where it's always been available they just didn't know how to make like a web app or any of that kind of stuff or they didn't want to go through the pain of having a a tab open on safari or whatever and so i can see that being a benefit but it's, this is probably going to be a month from now no one's going to be talking about it kind of thing you know it's cool that they're doing it but uh it's it's just a little bit i don't know wonder, water over the bridge at this point so i, I think that one of the reasons why it's good <clears throat> excuse me is um a yes for the people who they they don't know how to do stuff that's a good thing um but also like all i know that there's been times where i go to use it and then i get logged out because like their security mm. preferences are like we have to log you out after a certain amount of, amount of time and then when i go to log back in like my passwords are stupidly complicated i have a password manager and Sometimes the password manager doesn't interact very well with the web apps, but it works just fine with a regular app. And so I get into this stupid, I'll have to sit down at my computer, bring up my password, say, put this in big type. And then I'm like typing in my, my complicated password to get it to work. And then by the time I get it working, I'm like, okay, that was too much of a pain. I, I just can't be bothered <laughs> to use it now. So I like that it's going to be in the app store. We'll see if they actually do it. I don't see why they wouldn't. Um, Carrie, uh, you use Xbox Cloud streaming quite often, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Are you going to do? Are you going to bother with <laughs> it on? Well, you have an uh, Android phone, so this Android, doesn't affect yeah. you even a little. No, yeah, I'm. I'm glad that they finally changed their tune on it. Um, I'm hoping, you know, like we saw <laughs> the whole Fortnite Apple thing. Uh, is hilarious to me because like Google lost uh, uh, that that suit and you can install other app stores on Android like you have that ability you can sideload on Android since day one and Google lost Apple wins and you can't <laughs> like the sideloading is right. terrible it doesn't exist there is no other app store on Apple so how does Google lose when they've been doing you know, allowing other things to do. So you could still install Fortnite on Android fairly easily. And yeah. they were like, no, no, no. You know, when you say unknown sources, that looks really cryptic. You're going to need to change that. Also, and on Apple, it's like, yeah, you don't even have that ability. And you're like, yeah, that's, that's fine. Right. And it's just like, how, and like, I think even Apple lawyers are like, how do we win this? <laughs> like, how did this happen? Um, as we get closer and closer to this thing, I'm hoping that, uh, something happens generally with sideloading as a generality for Apple. Um, I just like that, especially for emulators. Apple makes very good chips. Apple makes very good chips, and their iPhones are very performant. And stuff that is written for those, those emulators, if you get the developer bills for them, are fantastic. So just from the emulator part of this, I wish that that would happen just because it would make installing on it way better. And people would be able to use their own stuff that's in an iPhone easier uh, because they're very performed. They actually, that's one compliment I will give Apple is that their ARM stuff and their GPUs are very good. Um, so any less restrictions to enjoy that, the better. 
that is gen generally my thing is hopefully that Apple gets closer and closer to this uh, through EU means or whatever. However, this has to happen. I think it's a better all overall situation. Uh, not saying that people like I have can use other stuff. I'm still going to use the Google Play Store because I like the Google Play Store. And I think everyone's mm -hmm. still going to use the Apple App Store because it works and it's fine. And, you know, buying stuff and you have all your stuff. Great. But I still think that people should be able to sideload stuff on there. I think I'm going to disagree with you. I think if you want to do that stuff, go buy an Android phone. Um, you know, having an iPhone, I don't have to worry about my mom calling me up because somebody tricked her. Because she's not a very tech savvy person. And somebody tricked her into sideloading some oh. malware onto her phone because she's well, not a tech savvy person. And that kind of thing. Like the same people who are always saying like Apple needs to allow other app stores to exist on their market. They're going to be the same people who are going to be writing headlines saying iPhones are suddenly full of malware. And I'm like, yep, that's exactly what's going to happen. I mean, there's malware on the app store already. Um, there's people that had their bitcoins taken from them on an official app store app. Just whoop, took all your took all your stuff, took your money. So long. Sayonara. And Apple mm -hmm. approved it. Uh, so the, you're, you are effectively also telling people that whatever is on the app store is totally safe when that is objectively false. Um, I'm not saying but that Apple it's has the ability to stop that. Like sure. when something happens, it comes through, Apple can step in and say, you're gone. Right. Apple can. can't do that if it's a For, secondary store. Yeah. And so once it's there, it's there forever and you're screwed. Uh, Yeah. I mean, Apple has a lot of security me mechanisms that they could offer the person to uninstall the app. Uh, but saying like it's going to be like a virus type of thing where it's going to be permanently on your phone. I, I don't know if Apple a iPhones actually operate like that because they're all isolated. They're all isolated islands. Like it's very, very hard to like whenever you open up an app, Ooh. it has its own file storage, right? You, you can't yeah. just like start no nosing around and noodling around on everything. Uh, so yeah, that isn't what I meant. What I meant is Apple doesn't have the ability to say, all right, that no longer exists on our right. store. That's sure. what I meant. Yeah. Uh, but I would just like to preface this, that you, a user, even though I understand most people aren't, everyone should still be concerned that whatever they're downloading isn't necessarily safe just because Apple approved it because people have been burned, uh, on multiple different apps. That's all. Well, Carrie and I disagree. Russ is going to get the last word on this. <laughs> uh, you know, there are there's several different methods to, to side loading on uh, iPhones. You know, they have like the alt store and the side store now. Um, they're all just a pain in the butt. And so from a very selfish reason, like I want to just have that to be able to side load stuff. To be honest, the emulation development on uh, Apple, or like an iPhone in particular, is not great because it's such a small audience and such a small development team. And so you do have Dolphin, you've got, and but it's a fork of Dolphin. It's not like the Dolphin team working on it, you know, and they've got a couple others like Providence and stuff, um, but it's it's just not there. It's not very robust. And so I would love to see that, you know, um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not yearning to play retro games on my iPhone. You know, there's so many other ways that we can do that. So that's fair. All right. Well, let us know in the comments down below uh, all the reasons why I'm wrong. And uh, <laughs> I, I look forward to your angry, angry comments. But uh, that's going to do it for us for this week. Uh, Carrie, you said you've got a video that just came out about the OLED deck. What's what's coming up after that? Uh, you know, you know? there's. Yeah, I have stuff that I've had on the back burner. It's just my real life job has been absorbing every ounce of my brain cells. Uh, so I, I've been just basically doing one video a week. But I have a SteamOS look and like Nux that are running 7840 HS. Um, I, I have to get the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, the unit I bought finally uh, came in. So I have to review that. I just don't know if I have the bandwidth to do it. Uh, so right now, the only thing I have is taking a look at the Steam Deck OLED uh, burn in. And there you go. And then Russ, uh, what are you burning in right now? Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of, today's a clean slate day for me. I just finished a video yesterday and so I'm just kind of working through, but one thing that came in the mail yesterday is this thing called the R 33 S this is a Mio mini ripoff basically, but with a different chipset. And so, uh, it's pretty interesting. You know, you can play some, uh, like ports. I can play shovel Knight and stardew Valley on this thing, which is kind of crazy. Um, but it also sucks. And so I don't know, I might make a video about it. I'm not sure yet. That's what, that's, that might be what I'm working on today. Sucks. That's what the S stands for. It also for. sucks. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, like the buttons are terrible on it. The the center button, this is the dumbest thing. The center button, which is the menu button, like if you have muscle memory, you press that to exit a game on the Mew Mini Plus. That's the reset button for the console. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's like you're just playing. Like, how do I get to the menu? Boom, reset your machine, basically. Fantastic. So, that's that's called yeah. the uh, I will no longer play that game. I was just playing button. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing for an and, hour. How do I save? Yeah. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> and so certain emulators, you know, because these are using custom firmwares that have been built for other devices, uh, th- it expects you to press like the L3 and R3 button to bring up like the PSP menu, for example. There's no L3 and R3 on this thing at all. So you cannot exit a game when you start a PSP <laughs> game at all. And so you have to hit the reset button basically Fantastic. to reset your device at that point. Amazing. And so there's many reasons why it sucks, but I, I don't know. We'll see if people like it or not. I I cannot wait to watch it and uh, hear all of your thoughts. But uh, that's going to do it for us this week. Thank you guys for hanging out with us uh, here on the Nerd Nest podcast. And we'll see you next time. Stay awesome, everybody. Bye-bye.